each desire to bring to our time together this morning. things that we need, depend on, that, that is a key element of our salvation is God's mercy. To know that God loved us enough to graciously and mercifully offer us forgiveness and to know that His grace and mercy are greater than the greatest of sins we could commit. To recognize that no matter what, God's mercy is more.
we constantly run. What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the wings, the violence, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the of every blessing that we enjoy. Come thou fount, come thou king.
seated. And as you're sitting down, I'll go ahead and dismiss the elementary school age kids in the room here. You guys meet up by the back doors with your leader to head on upstairs for Kids Connection. And we'll see you guys after the service. There are a, a few quick things I'd like to draw your attention to just by way of announcements of stuff that's coming up today and in the weeks ahead. Uh, one is we are having a hot dog lunch right after church this morning, so uh, barbecued hot dogs. Uh, so stick around and join us for that. Um, we're still kind of waiting to see what the weather's going to be. It's sunny, it's a little cold, and it's supposed to be windy, so we're still not sure if it's going to be on the lawn or downstairs. Uh, to my guys in the room, here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to get the word like right at the end of the service where it's going to be, and depending on where it's going to be, I'm going to ask every able-bodied guy to go downstairs and grab a table and chairs and either roll them upstairs or set them up downstairs, and we'll kind of just do it on the spur of the moment. But the hot dogs will be ready to go, so stick around and join us for that. It should be a good time. Uh, secondly, growth groups are starting up this week. We delayed the start by one week. Uh, most of that was my fault from being out of town and kind of getting behind on things, but we're starting up this week. Groups are meeting on Tuesday and Thursday. We have two groups meeting on each of those evenings in different homes here in the community. Uh, the sign-up is still available on the, the main page uh, our, our, of our church website, so you can still sign up for that if you haven't yet. Uh, for those of you who are signed up, you should have received an email from your group's leader uh, by now. So if you haven't, let me know, and I will make sure to get that word to uh, whoever is leading the group that you're in, and we'll make sure to get you the information on the, the location that your group will be meeting. So those start this week. Uh, looking out to next weekend, Saturday, August 13th, we are planning a, a spring cleaning all church work day here at the church, Saturday from 9 to noon. We've got a lot of different projects that the trustees have kind of compiled, things that we'd like to address as a church. So if you can spare uh, any portion of that time or all of that time on Saturday morning between 9 and noon, we would be grateful to have your help as we look to take care of the property that God has blessed us with here. Looking out another week to Sunday, April 21st, um, did I say August 13th? Wow, no, it's April 13th next week. I don't know where that, I wrote August 13th, can you believe that? That's crazy. Okay, no, so next week is April 13th on Saturday, the following week, April 21st, on Sunday, we are going to be offering another church membership and information class. There's a, a few of you here in the church fellowship that have expressed your interest in finding out more about what it means to join the church in membership or even to just get a little bit more information about the church and its history. Uh, so I invite you to join us for that. It will be right after church on Sunday the 21st. We'll provide lunch. Uh, do me a favor, if that's something you're interested in, let me know after the service or or drop a, a, an email or a phone call to the church office and just let us know. That way we make sure we have food enough for everybody. Uh, it should last probably between an hour and a half and two hours with lunch included. Uh, just a chance to hear a little bit about the church, about what church membership is all about, and if you desire to become a member of the church, that's the first step on the, on the road to that. So that will be Sunday, April 21st. 
And lastly, Friday, April 26th, our homeschool group that meets at the church here is going to be presenting a student showcase Friday the 26th in the evening from 6.30 to 8 p.m., and it's a chance for the students to showcase some of the things that they have been working on throughout the school year. So uh, that will be set up here at the church. Invite you to come and just kind of check out what our homeschool group has been doing over the last several months. The kids are excited to show those things off. So that's Friday, April 26th. Lots of stuff going on in April. All right, let's take a moment and let's pray again, and then we will jump into our study of the Bible together. Will you pray with me? God, we want to come to the Bible with open ears, open hearts, open minds. Uh, Lord, it is Your Word, what You have provided and preserved for us. It's what You want us to know and understand. And God, it's clear, the, the more we look at it, we, the more we realize how relevant and important it is for our daily lives today. It's not just a, a history book that records for us things from the past and what You've done. It's the message of your love and your mercy and grace, your offer of forgiveness. It's the message of you sending your son to provide for us that opportunity for a right relationship and forgiveness. It's not just history, it's his story. And so, Lord, I pray that as we open your word together this morning, that you would lead us by your spirit to handle it rightly, to interpret it rightly and to see its relevance to our daily lives. And we ask this now in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, there's a, a YouTube channel that Julia and I stumbled across, I don't know, it's probably been some months ago now, just, you know, you kind of surf around and things pop up in your feed. And, and we enjoy watching it together. They put out new episodes every Friday, the end of every week. It's called Fridays with Frank. And Frank is a Pinell County, Arizona sheriff's deputy. He works as a part of their traffic unit, and his whole job is to ride around in an unmarked police car within his county and just pull people over. That's what he does all day, every day. He pulls people over for various traffic issues, you know, speeding, illegal U-turns, improper vehicle equipment, expired registration, whatever it is. And there's a camera crew that rides around with him and records his interactions with people. It's always interesting. Frank is a, is a great guy. He's very personable. He's very uh, uh, kind of straightforward, but, but has a bit of humor. And so uh, I, always, I always find it interesting to watch how people react when they get pulled over, because usually they don't see it coming. It's an unmarked car. It has lights hidden in the grill and underneath, and so it, it lights up like a Christmas tree when he flips the switch, but you wouldn't really know it to look at the car. Some people, because they don't see it coming, some are argumentative. Uh, they want to argue with him about whether they did or didn't do or uh, whether they were going as fast as his radar locked them in at going. Some accuse him of just being mean. You're so mean pulling me over. Uh, the ones that uh, amuse me particularly are the ones that as they're sitting there on the side of the road and he is explaining to them that you were 30 miles an hour above the posted speed limit, they say, yeah, but so is that guy that just went by, how come you're not, you're not chasing him? Because I'm talking to you right now. And, and then there's, you know, others that are quick to admit they're wrong and, and apologize and, and still others that he hasn't even made it to their window yet, and they're already asking for a warning or just, you know, a break of some kind. Some recognize him from the videos. Some want his autograph or a picture with him. And he's all polite, but he's very direct. I, I have come to recognize that Frank is not someone who usually gives warnings. He, he, if he pulls you over, you're likely getting a ticket because that's his whole job is to enforce those laws. People try and talk their way out of it sometimes. Oh, I didn't know what the speed limit was here. To which he usually gestures to the windshield-sized speed limit sign just up the road and says, well, it's right there. So, the warnings are right there. Now, watching those videos, I, I sometimes think how similar people's reactions are to Frank, how similar they are to sometimes people's reactions to God. I suppose a number of people don't like the fact that God has rules, that there is right and wrong according to God. 
that there are consequences for breaking those rules. Some people seem to like to make their way through life kind of just oblivious to the fact that God is watching, as though what we do in private nobody else knows about, and yet Scripture tells us that God knows even the very thoughts and intentions we have, not just that He sees what is done in secret. Others seem to think they're getting away with something just because they haven't gotten caught yet, but it doesn't mean we're getting away with anything. The Bible tells us, and and this is no treat to be informed of, the Bible tells us that there will come a day when every single one of us will have to stand before God and give account for the way we lived our lives, why we said what we said, why we did what we did. And in that day, everyone will fully realize just how perfect and holy God is and just how imperfect and sinful we are. No amount of flattery, no amount of whining, no amount of excuses will change the judgment that God has promised will come. And the warning signs are there. It's just whether or not we heed those warning signs. This morning, we're making our way back into our study in the book of Daniel. And it's been a couple of weeks. We had Easter in here. So it's been a couple of weeks since we were in Daniel. Let me kind of refresh our memories as to where we were. Uh, We were introduced in Daniel chapter 5 to a king by the name of Belshazzar. He was the current ruling king in the city of Babylon. He ruled some years after Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon for the first four chapters that we went through in Daniel. And without any real transition from the end of chapter 4 to the beginning of chapter 5, suddenly there's a new king. Belshazzar, uh, as we meet him, he's throwing this huge party invites all of his nobles, people from throughout his kingdom there, huge party, and, and you know, the drinks are flowing, and, and the party's raging, and in the drunken revelry, he calls for the sacred vessels from Jerusalem's temple. When Babylon, years earlier under Nebuchadnezzar, had conquered Jerusalem, they took into their treasury all of the gold articles that were used in worship of God. They took all of those into the treasury, and Belshazzar has this idea, hey, I got an idea. Let's pull those things out of the safe, and let's fill them with wine, and let's, let's have a toast. Let's, let's drink. And so, they, they fill them with wine, and they continue to party, and, and they begin holding those up, and they begin praising the gods of the elements. Oh, praise the god of gold. Praise the god of silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. And right in the middle of them doing all of that, as they are desecrating these these holy articles that were used strictly for the worship of God in Jerusalem, as they are doing that, suddenly a hand appears and the finger extends and begins writing on the plaster of the wall. And you can imagine how the DJ just yanked the needle, things stopped playing, it got real quiet, the king went pale, his knees started knocking as they all watched in probably abject terror. King was, king was absolutely shaken. He called for his wise men to come in and interpret the writing. What does it say? What does it mean? And his offer was, look, any one of you who can actually do this, who can read that and tell me what it means, I will give you a purple robe of royalty. I will give you a royal gold necklace. I will make you the third highest ruler in the kingdom of Babylon, only beneath myself as number two and my father number one. I'll put you in the third slot. But none of them could give the interpretation. And having heard the uproar, the queen mother came in, ascertained what was going on and said, hey, there's this guy that, that has been one of the wise men in this country since he was taken captive from Jerusalem. His name is Daniel, and boy, he certainly knew what was up when Nebuchadnezzar was the king. You should, you should pull him out of, out of mothballs there. Ask him to come in and see if he can help you out. And so, that's where we pick up this morning. 
The king calls for Daniel. Daniel does come and interpret the inscription, which speaks very clearly of God's coming judgment in Belshazzar's life. There's three things that I want us to see in the verses that we're going to look at together this morning. We're going to finish up the the rest of chapter 5 in our time together this morning. But first, I think one of the things that we need to realize is that empty flattery doesn't fool God. Empty flattery doesn't fool God. Belshazzar, for his part, gives kind of half-hearted praise to Daniel as he comes in. Uh, and, And I think in, in a lot the same way, some people give grudging acknowledgement to God. They kind of feign that, oh yeah, God is, God is, well, God is God, you know. And I, I just don't think that that sort of empty flattery, it just, it doesn't fool God. God knows what's really going on in our hearts. Secondly, there is a clear call to pay attention to the warnings of God's judgment. Pay attention to the warnings of God's judgment. They're not hollow, empty threats. God warns of what people will face for disobedience. And when God says it, you better believe it because He doesn't make idle threats. And thirdly, we'll see a difference between what Daniel did here and what we then should be doing today. Daniel proclaimed wrath. That's what God brought him in to do. He proclaimed wrath. We, as God's people today, are to preach repentance. So there's a a subtle difference here, and and we'll dig into that a little bit more. It's not, of course, that we shouldn't warn of God's judgment. It's just that we are not in the same position Daniel was in to be able to proclaim God's wrath and judgment and say, it's too late for you. There is no turning back. You are judged. Judged. Belshazzar partied like he didn't have a care in the world. And I I think many people today live their lives in the same way. I want to give you the sober truth of our passage right here at the very front of things because I think it's something we just need to bear in mind. It's this, that a carefree present does not guarantee a consequence-free future. I think a lot of people live like, hey, I'm doing all right now, so nothing's going to change. You know what, friends? A carefree present doesn't guarantee a consequence-free future. Just because everything seems to be all right right now doesn't mean that we are doing everything right in God's eyes. Just because God hasn't put a stop to what we are doing right now doesn't mean He's okay with it. God promises that He will judge sin. So, let's go ahead and open our Bibles together. As I said, we are in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Uh, In the Bibles there in the pew rack in front of you, the page you're looking for will be 796, 796 in the pew Bibles. We are picking up at Daniel chapter 5 and verse 13 is where we're going to begin our study together this morning. Daniel chapter 5 verse 13, again page 796 in the pew Bibles. And again, one of the first things I think we can interpret from our passage is that empty flattery doesn't fool God. Belshazzar offered flattering words to Daniel, but they they rang a little hollow. They seemed to be mixed with condescension and some low expectations. Follow along as I read the first few verses for us. Daniel chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now, I have heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me, that they might read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message." But I personally have heard about you that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed in purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. I think we're led to understand here this may very well be Belshazzar's first time meeting 
Daniel. Uh, we don't know that they had, although Daniel had been in the kingdom and, and actually was a leader among the wise men of Babylon for many, many years, it seems like this is their, their first encounter because the king begins by confirming his identity in verse 13. But did you notice there's a few things woven in there that I can't help but wonder if it's not just a little bit of condescension. I, I feel like the king has worded his his uh, introduction there in such a way as to make sure that Daniel knows his place. The king first identifies Daniel as one of the captives. Hey, are you one of those exiles, one of those people that we took captive back in the day that, that King Nebuchadnezzar yanked out of your homeland and, and forced into servitude here, having come from Judah? So, basically, do you understand, I'm the king, are you that prisoner that we took those decades ago, just wanted to make sure you know who you are and I know who you are. And from there, Belshazzar cites some of Daniel's abilities and his character, and it sounds nice, but again here, I think a careful reading shows that the king himself doesn't necessarily know these things about Daniel. It's just, it's hearsay. Look again at, the, at verse 14 and, and the beginning of verse 16. He says, now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. And skip down to the beginning of verse 16, but I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. So he's heard these things, and, and really those things he just heard a few moments ago when the queen mother said, hey, there's this guy named Daniel. Although she said, hey, there's... A, the spirit of the holy gods is in him. He, he kind of dumbs that part down a little bit. Well, I heard that, I don't know, something about gods speak through you or something. So, it's interesting that he relates what he has heard. But when we looked at Nebuchadnezzar, the times that Nebuchadnezzar brought Daniel in to ask for help interpreting something, you remember what Nebuchadnezzar said? I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. I know what your life is about. I know what you are capable of. Belshazzar's words were little more than, I think, kind of court-appropriate flattery. This is just the way you politely address somebody you're trying to get something out of. All the more reason to say, hey, listen, I'll make you third highest in the kingdom here if you just tell me what I want to know. Give me the answer. You can also see that it appears the king had pretty low expectations for Daniel, being able to do what his wise men could not. Verse 15, he says, Just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this inscription and make known its interpretation to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. And then picking up in the middle of verse 16, Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, and here, here's his offer, you'll be clothed with purple, wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you'll have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. The king's own wise men had come in first to try and do what the king had asked, and the king had said, hey, which, whichever one, any one of you guys who can do what I'm asking you to do, here's my offer, I'm going to make you the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But with Daniel now, it's not it's not whoever, it's not any one of you, it's, hey, if, if you can do what my guys couldn't do, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the same thing that I was going to offer them. You'll get the promotion. I don't know, to me, all of Belshazzar's words here kind of ring hollow. It just seems like empty flattery. It's not something that he really was excited to have Daniel there. I don't think he really believed that Daniel could do anything different than any of the other wise men. And again, I think sometimes people take that same sort of approach with God today. I'm not sure that sometimes people don't think that, well, God will look with favor on me if I behave a certain way. If I do certain things, then, then God will look at me and say, he's all right, she's all right. I, I try to do more good than bad, maybe you'll hear a person say. I, I remember one young lady saying, you know, this one time I, I cheated on an exam in college, but then I went 
to the park and I picked up trash for an hour. So I, I figure they kind of cancel each other out. <laughs> it's like thinking that God evaluates us by putting us on a scale. And as long as the scale tips towards the good side, we're okay in God's eyes. As long as we do more good than bad, everything is okay, as though God could be so easily manipulated. Still others, I think, imagine that God is pleased with them if they just say certain things, if they, if they talk or represent themselves a certain way. And, and maybe it's, it's praying a certain way, well, I have to make sure that I use that, that stained glass kind of Christianese when I pray because, you know, when I use lots of these and thous and thys, I think God appreciates that when I use that kind of language when I pray. Or, or maybe it's the, the, the Christian bumper sticker they slap on their car. Well, see, everybody knows what I believe because I slapped a WWJD sticker on my, on my bumper there. What would Jesus do? Okay, great. Those things are fine. But when the rest of a person's life looks different than the message on that bumper sticker or, or what's coming out of their mouth, it, it really kind of muddies the message, you know? Praying before a meal in a restaurant, you know, publicly praying, that can be a, a great testimony. It, it's also a testimony when after you say amen, you berate the waitress and, and run her down for not bringing the food fast enough or not bringing the right thing. That's a testimony too. Having a, a, maybe a Christian fish symbol on the back of your car, yeah, yeah, that's a testimony. But so is the aggressive driving and honking and that middle finger you extend towards the other driver. That tells people something too. When we, when we talk one way but, but live another, it makes our words sound empty. And empty flattery of whatever sort we might imagine. It doesn't fool God. Let's get back to our text here. Daniel actually declines the king's offer of the, the promotion and the robe and the gold necklace, but he interprets the writing anyway. And what, what I believe he says here cautions us to pay attention to the warnings of God's judgment. Before he even translates the inscription, Daniel cites the reason for the judgment that it contained. Pick up with me in verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O king, the Most High God granted sovereignty grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wished, he killed. Whomever he wished, he spared alive. And whomever he wished, he elevated. And whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of beasts and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized the most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that He sets over it whomever He wishes. Yet you, His son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this, but you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of His house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand. But the God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways you have not glorified. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. So Daniel points Belshazzar here 
back to the example of his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. And you'll remember from a couple of weeks ago, if you were with us, when we looked at the first part of Daniel 5, when Belshazzar is referred to as the son of Nebuchadnezzar, the word here doesn't limit itself to mean like direct descendant. It could mean descendant, and, and it is entirely possible from what we read from historians that recorded things outside of the Bible, it is possible that Nebuchadnezzar might have been Belshazzar's grandfather by marriage. At the very least, it means descendant or, or one who follows after a predecessor. So he is in that same line. And so Daniel points him back to Nebuchadnezzar as his predecessor. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar was a great king. He ruled the most powerful nation on earth for a good long time. But when he grew proud and God ultimately confronted him, it took seven long years, but he finally acknowledged that God was greater than he was. All that Nebuchadnezzar had had been granted to him by God. He enjoyed nearly unlimited power, but that pride led to him eating grass like cattle for seven years until he finally was willing to acknowledge and recognize that the Most High God was ruler over all humanity and that God and God alone was the one who established and removed kings, that He was the one who had put Nebuchadnezzar in that position of authority. When Nebuchadnezzar finally acknowledged that, he was restored to sanity and his kingdom was restored to him. The thing is, Belshazzar knew all of this. And likely not just from the history books, it is actually entirely possible that he witnessed all of this firsthand. Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus, who was the, the first ruler in the kingdom, Belshazzar was ruling Babylon under his father's authority. Nabonidus was an official in Nebuchadnezzar's court. So, Belshazzar's father had worked under Nebuchadnezzar. That means that Belshazzar would have likely been living in Babylon with his father and had seen Nebuchadnezzar's rule as a child or as a, a young man. He probably would have seen firsthand when God's judgment fell on Nebuchadnezzar and he was reduced to living like an animal for those years. He had likely seen with his own eyes what had happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, he refused to humble himself before the Most High God. Just like a, a speed limit sign or, or a no trespassing sign, the warning signs of God's judgment, they had been there. Plenty of things that he should have been able to look at and say, ooh, you know, I'm not sure I should be doing this. But he paid no attention. He blew right past them. He throws this extravagant party exalting himself. He calls for the sacred articles of the temple of Jerusalem to be brought in and to be filled with wine so that they can toast the gods of the elements. It was a slap in the face of God. Not only that, but as they partied with these holy vessels as their cups, they, they praised the unseeing, unhearing, unknowing false gods of gold, silver, iron, bronze, wood, stone. They completely ignored the Most High God who held their very lives, who held their very breath, their futures in His hand. Pay attention to the warnings of God's judgment. Belshazzar knew what he was supposed to do, but he failed to do it. He did not heed the warning signs that had been there, and he was now doomed. And, you know, God has given us ample warning signs today. This right here contains some of His most direct warnings to each and every one of us. It is the Bible which warns us of the judgment that every one of us will face as a consequence of the sin in our lives, as a consequence of the wrong choices that we make. Choices that violate God's will and His Word, choices that violate our own conscience, things we know are wrong and yet we, eh, we do it anyway. 
It's right here in the Bible that we see that the wages of sin is death, that the payment that we earn for doing these wrong things in our life is to be separated from God for all eternity in a horrible place of torment called hell because we disobeyed the Most High God. And the thing is, none of us will have a valid excuse in that day as for why we did what we did. God's Word is clear. It's not just that God has revealed Himself in His creation, in, in these words, it's that He's revealed Himself in His creation as well. In Romans chapter 1, let me read just real quick for us. Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, the Apostle Paul writes that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. It's the history of humanity. Always looking to put something else in God's place. I'd rather do it my way. I'd rather, I'd rather imagine a God that makes me feel better about me doing things the way I want to do them. The truth is we have only one hope because there is only one way to be saved. And yeah, while the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul later says in that same book of Romans that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And the fact remains that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we just need to pay attention to the warnings of God's judgment. They're right here. And we need to let others know too, warning them of what's coming. But, but this is where we then differ somewhat from Daniel, because Daniel proclaimed wrath. We are to preach repentance. Daniel had explained to Belshazzar that he should have known better. He should have taken the warning contained in the life experiences of his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He should have taken those to heart. And now he provides the king with the translation and interpretation of the inscription. Back in Daniel chapter 5, verse 24, excuse me, verse 25, now this is the inscription that was written out, mene, mene, tekel, uparsin. This is the interpretation of the message, mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and over to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave orders and clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. The message was one of God's coming judgment and wrath. Daniel explains for the king what his wise men could not. It's possible that they could have read the words, they just didn't get the interpretation. The thing about Hebrew and Aramaic is that it's all consonants, there's no vowels. So it's, it's all these compressed consonants and you have, to, you have to be able to look at it and understand what the word is and then kind of supply the vowels. But the vowels can be different, and so those three consonants might represent a host of different words. They might have looked at it and kind of interpreted it in a, a financial or a, a way scale kind of thing. A, a mina was a unit of, 
of like monetary value, mina, mina, shekel, and, and pares would mean half. So, you know, it's a mina, mina, shekel, and a half. Okay, well, something about money or weights or measures, I don't know what it means. God gave Daniel understanding to rightly interpret the inscription. He, he took the words more in their verbal form, and they meant numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. And Daniel explained that this was the message of God's judgment. Mene, Belshazzar's days were numbered. God said it twice. His evil rule, his life would soon be over. Tekel, Belshazzar had been weighed or measured And he had been found deficient. He was lacking. It's as though God's moral laws had been placed on one side of the scale and Belshazzar's life had been placed on the other and Belshazzar did not measure up to God's standard of righteousness. In fact, none of us do. Peres, the kingdom was about to be taken from him, divided divided into pieces, destroyed, dissolved. More particularly, it was about to be given to the armies that were camped right outside the city wall. The Medo-Persian army had been coming against the city of Babylon for, I think, history tells us, about two and a half years at this point they had been trying to breach the city. Babylon hadn't been captured in in about a thousand years by this point. They had immense walls, double walls and and defenses, and the Euphrates River ran right through the middle of the city. They had plenty of land within the city walls to cultivate food and livestock, and so it just, you couldn't like starve them out or anything. There was just no way to get in. But Daniel, without giving us the details, simply says that very evening Belshazzar was killed and Darius the Mede took over as the ruler of the kingdom. Uh, extra-biblical historians outside of, of the Scripture here fill in some of the gaps for us that that impenetrable city of Babylon actually fell without a fight. That evening, big party going on in the palace. Well, the river Euphrates ran right through the middle of the city, right under the wall, but you couldn't get in. So what the Medo-Persian army had done, they went way upstream and they diverted the river. And the water level dropped and dropped and dropped, until their army could just walk right in the riverbed underneath the wall. Nobody expected them to come in in the riverbed under the cover of darkness, and so they just walked right in and took over the city. God did not offer Belshazzar the opportunity to repent. He didn't offer him an opportunity to give glory to the Most High God as He should have done. He did not offer him the same opportunity at repentance that God had offered Nebuchadnezzar, his predecessor. Daniel interpreted the message to just strictly be one of judgment. I want to back the focus out here for just a minute because I I think it can be tempting sometimes to look at things going on in the world around us, to look at at the failures and and the death in the world and to look at people in this world and imagine that, well, see, that's the judgment of God right there. See what happened to that person who did not honor the Lord. But the question we have to really wrestle with is, does God judge people the same way today as He did right here with Belshazzar? Some examples, when, when the Nazis were defeated, in in 1945, when then Hitler killed himself in a bunker in Berlin, was that the judgment of God? Some people might say yes, some might say no. What about an epidemic, a health epidemic ripping through the gay community? What about the bombing of an abortion clinic? What about a child molester being beaten to death by the father of his victim? Is that the judgment of God in those cases? By contrast, what about What about a Christian missionary being killed by the very people he or she is trying to share Christ with? Is that the judgment of God? This is where we as Christians today, we're we're clearly in a different situation than Daniel was in. God specifically gave Daniel a message to interpret for Belshazzar. He proclaimed judgment, and God proclaimed through Daniel that it was too late. God's followers today, we are not in that same position to be able to proclaim final judgment on people. We're not. 
Yes, we should certainly warn people of God's coming judgment because He makes it very clear in His Word. It is coming. But we're never in a position to say that a person is completely condemned and beyond the reach of God's mercy. We're not in that position. Only God judges. That means that we can never really know with certainty whether suffering or death is God's judgment or it's not. So, disease, disaster, death, all of those things, frankly, they are no more necessarily a sign of God's judgment than the common cold. Now, all of these things are a result of sin. There wouldn't be disease and death if it were not for sin in the world. So, yeah, ultimately, there's sin at the root of all of these things, but those things in and of themselves do not represent God's particular judgment on that individual for their individual sin. We cannot make that conclusion. Our role is not to judge. Our role is to offer the good news of repentance and restoration. We're to offer words of life, not condemnation. We're not to seek the destruction of people who deny God. We are to pray for their redemption. The truth is, is that the Lord is patient with us. According to Peter in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is patient with us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's what God desires. The truth is, according to John 3, 16 and 17, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but would have eternal life. Because God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. You know, it's, it's not difficult to be angry with sin it's, it's really easy for us to point fingers and, and assign blame. We can be quick to judge. We can find ourselves glad that we're not caught in the same sin. But do we grieve for the sin of other people? Does, does it drive us to the point of wanting to weep for that person? Wanting to just drop to our knees and pray for that person? Do we grieve for sin in the lives of others? That's hard work. Rather than condemnation and wrath, we need to preach repentance. We need to love others enough to share with them God's message of love and forgiveness. We need to pray and grieve for those who have refused to accept God's grace and mercy in their lives. So often, I think these people don't even know what it is that they're facing. They have no idea that there's a God that loves them, but that He has standards. We should love them enough to warn them. Belshazzar's last hours were lived like he didn't have a care in the world. But what we see clearly in this passage in Daniel 5 is that a carefree present doesn't guarantee a consequence-free future. God is a perfect judge. One day He will ultimately judge every single person for the way in which we have lived. And sometimes we see something of God's judgment in the present, though we can never say with certainty that that's specifically what it is. Other times people seem to get away with living the most reckless lives we can imagine and they seem blessed beyond measure and like there's, there's no consequences. But God will judge every one of us. None of us will have any excuses for our failures. Our only hope is found in Jesus Christ. His death on the cross for our sins. So don't ever make the mistake of imagining that just because things are going well, right now that God must be okay with our sinful choices. A carefree present doesn't guarantee a consequence-free future. Let's pray. God, I thank You for the grace and the mercy that You have extended toward us, that You love us enough to offer us what we don't deserve. You loved us enough to send Your Son to take our punishment on Himself so that you could extend that offer of forgiveness and salvation to each one of us. Something that we didn't earn, something we didn't deserve, something we couldn't hope to pay for or repay you for, but something you've offered us freely. God, help us to never 
get mired in complacency, thinking that it's okay because I'm not facing any immediate problems. Help us to rightly understand the truth, right and wrong, according to your design, your will. Lord, give us the humility to admit our wrongs, to seek your forgiveness. Uh, Thank you for the love that you've shown us in Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and, and sing another song of just offering to the Lord. We have the privilege of closing out our time together this morning by celebrating communion together, a remembrance of what the Lord has done for us, of what God did in allowing His Son, calling His Son Jesus to lay down His life for ours, to extend to us that offer of forgiveness. As I said, God is a perfect judge. He he will do what is right every single time. You think of our justice system today in our culture Hopefully they get it right more often than not, but it's not perfect. God is. I mean, how, how absurd would it be if somebody had been arrested for the murder of another person and they were brought in and, and, they, and all the evidence is there, there's witnesses, there's, there's evidence, everything's there, and the person even admits it. You're right, Your Honor, you know what? I, I murdered that person in cold blood, but I'm really sorry and you know what, in, in the couple of years before you caught me, I actually, I, 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 uh, I started knitting caps for babies at the orphanage, and I've been, I've been helping out at the shelter for the dogs, and so I, I'm kind of hoping that, you know, because I'm, I'm sorry and, and I've been doing all these things that you could just, you could find it in your heart to just forgive me and let me go. That wouldn't be justice, would it? We, we would think that's a horrible judge who would look at something like that and say, oh yeah, it's Okay. Or a judge says, you know what, I just, I'm a really compassionate person, so I like you enough, I'm just going to say, don't worry about it. That's not justice. God is just. Perfectly. God can't just say, it's okay. It doesn't matter. God can't just turn a blind eye to the things we've done wrong. He can't just pretend it never happened. And no amount of good that we do, no amount of picking up trash in the park after cheating on the test, no amount of that is going to undo what we've done. That's why God had to send His Son. Because we can't undo it ourselves. We can't pay for it ourselves. Christ lived that perfect life that none of us 
have proved capable of living. He did it all right every single time. And yet he went to that cross not to die for himself or his own sins. He went to die for ours as the perfect God-man. His sacrifice, God said, was sufficient to pay for the sins of every single person in the world. But God offers it as a gift, and, and thus it has to be received as a gift. It's not something that God just kind of blanket applies to every one of us. It's something He offers. Like if I was to offer you the keys to my car, say, here, I want you to have my car. Well, if you don't take the keys, you don't have the car, first of all. Nor could you really pay me for it. You couldn't fish into your pocket and go, oh, hey, you know what? Here, I got a quarter. I I can pay you for the car. It wouldn't matter what you paid. It wouldn't be a gift anymore. God offers it as a gift. It's a gift, that forgiveness that's received by faith, by believing what God said. By believing that Jesus is who the Bible shows Him to be. By believing that He he willingly died in our place. By believing and understanding that there's no other hope that we have of being able to save ourselves. It is only through faith in Christ. But then having received that gift, we can know for certain we're saved. Saved from the consequences of sin, we are forgiven. And so that's what we celebrate. Every time we share in communion together, we recall back to what Christ did for us. Sacrificing His life, His broken body, His shed blood done for us. And so we're going to share in that together this morning. And this is something that is intended to be open to everyone and anyone who believes in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a member of this church to join us in this. I would say you do have to be a member of God's church. You you really do have to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And and here's why. It's not that this doesn't make Christians better somehow. It doesn't make us more right in God's eyes. But it doesn't do that for anyone. I I wouldn't want you, if you you sit here this morning and you say, you know, I I don't know if I'd call myself a Christian. I haven't really, haven't confessed my sin to God or really believed in Christ. You know, maybe you're on the fence. Don't then. You know what? Just don't. You just let it pass by. It's okay because the last thing I would want is for you to think, well, I took communion at church that one time, so that must mean I'm, I'm okay then. I'm saved, right? No, this doesn't save you. It's just faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Beauty of that is, is you can make that decision right now where you sit. It's not about being in church or having to come to the front. It is in the quietness of your own heart and mind. You can pray right now and acknowledge your sin before God. Confess it to him. He knows it. He already knows it. Just just agree with him. You're right, God. I'm wrong. I've done those things. Ask him to forgive you. Believe in Jesus, and you'll be saved. And with that, then, let's share in this together. I'm going to invite my servers to stand, and we're going to pass these trays from one to the next. I invite you to hold on to your piece of the bread until everyone has been served and the men have come back up here to the front so that we can share in it together. We'll share in the reading of Scripture as well. Dave, could I ask you to pray for us as we do that?
Paul in his letter to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, writes about the Lord's last supper with his disciples, and he says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Long before Jesus' sacrifice, all the way back, even into the pages of the first book of the Bible, we see that sin required sacrifice. There was a sacrificial system that was practiced in Judaism from the earliest days and really even predates Judaism of sacrificing an animal as atonement for sin. It was a temporary thing. It was only meant to cover temporarily, and so God sent His Son to be that final sacrifice the perfect, unblemished Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the once-for-all sacrifice so that no others would be required. And it was by His broken body and especially by His blood shed for our sins that we can find that forgiveness through faith in Him. I invite my men to stand here. We're going to share again in the cup. And once again, if you would hold on to it until everyone has received theirs so that we can share in it together. I invite you to take this time, though, and pray. Pray and, again, confess to the Lord any sin that He has brought to mind that you haven't yet brought before Him humbly in repentance. Thank Him for His gift of eternal life and forgiveness through faith in Christ. Reuben, would you pray for us?